This is a fan generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazoff.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And make sure to order Jamie Glazov's new critically acclaimed jihadist psychopath. How he is charming, seducing, and devouring us. All your support is greatly appreciated. Hi, this is Brock Lurie, and this is the Brock Lurie Moment brought to you by the Glazov Gang. Today, I want to discuss about the coronavirus situation and how we need to understand math. There is a fundamental lack of appreciation for math in this situation, and it's really dangerous. We need to understand that math is a gift that God gives to us, along with science. We are supposed to use math and science in order to find God and in order to understand the world around us. But we're seeing very little math and very little science and very little logic, and for that matter, very little in the way of questions that we should be asking and therefore answering when it comes to this virus situation. Okay, the very first question that needs to be posed is, is sheltering or shelter at home the only way to deal with containing a virus? We went headlong into this sheltering business without ever asking the question, is this the only way? Now, Sweden asked a different question, of course, and a couple of other states did, but as a worldwide matter, it seemed everyone raced into this without asking themselves whatsoever the one question, does it work? Will it work? And comparing it to other pandemics of the past. 1957, in the late 60s, there's one as well, SARS, and so on. There were other pandemics and such. Ah, they say, but this one is so contagious, you see. Putting aside the problem, that the more contagious a virus is, the less deadly it tends to be. Putting that aside, it still begs the question, how contagious is it? And can we do anything about it? Now, ultimately, if we're really trying to save lives, then we have to look at the death rate, right? So if I were to tell you, for example, that every time you go into a plane that you have a one in two chance of crashing in that plane, you'd say, no thanks. But if I were to tell you, you have a one in 10 million chance of dying from a crash in that plane, you would say, okay, sign me up. So we need to know what that death rate is, what that, the chance of dying is if you are to be infected. All right, so for that, you need to have both a numerator and a denominator for the death rate, right? The denominator, of course, being the the actual infections, the number of infections. We are finding out from the Stanford study, my alma mater, by the way, and also other uh, studies, now USC included, showing that we are 50 to 85 times more infected in terms of number of people than we previously thought. In other words, the denominator of this fraction, the death rate, is a hell of a lot bigger than we thought. And if that's the case, then it means that the death rate is a lot smaller. Now it appears that instead of it being point, uh, sorry, 4% or so, it ends up being anywhere between 0.5 and 0.1%, 0.05 and 0.1% of a death rate. That's not very much. It's not enough to be terrified about. And the question is whether or not it's a terrified enough to be terrified to close down the entire economy with all its consequences, which we'll talk about in a moment. The next question is about the numerator. What is the numerator? We don't know. Different countries and different states apparently have different ways of counting who is, who is dying from the coronavirus and who's not. Sweden, for example, we now know, is very aggressive about counting the people who have died from the coronavirus, they tend to be pretty accurate, but they also include people from nursing homes where, not surprisingly, you would expect to see more people dying from the coronavirus uh, than in other places throughout, uh, throughout the, any given city or state. So that's what we have here. In Sweden, they're counting it. So the numbers seem to be higher. 
But that's in comparison to other countries who may or may not be including those extra deaths. A lot of these other countries are only including hospital deaths, deaths in hospitals. Okay, so skewing that even further is the issue of when do they decide that a death is a coronavirus death? Okay, well, there are people who will come in and, and they're, they might be elderly, they might have comorbidities such as diabetes or uh, respiratory failure and otherwise. And if they die in the hospital, they will ascribe that death to, guess what? The coronavirus. So that numerator number goes way up, or at least is very false. While the denominator number has not been uh, adapted to reflect the infection rate. Therefore, you've got a much higher numerator than, than it should be and a much lower denominator that, than it should be thus suggesting a much higher death rate. Not good. Not only that, you should ask some questions such as, why is the death rate so different among different countries? It shouldn't be. It should be exactly the same. The virus doesn't know if you're Iranian or Chinese or, or whatever. It, it should know only that you're a human being and that's it. The death rate needs to be approximately the same everywhere you go. You, you would, and you, if you want to parse out anything, you would parse it out only for demographics. So, for example, those aged 65 or older, those who have comorbidities and so forth. But they're not doing that. So it's so hard to parse out these, you know, different factors and different variables. So you're not able to get a serious idea of what to do. Certainly... We should have factored in all these possibilities before we decide to close down the whole world's economy because there are some serious issues associated with closing down the world's economy, including a depression, including the suicides that result from that, including the hunger and the poverty that result from that, and, and the infrastructure that forever changes. To say nothing of the very strong possibility of aggravated wars uh, because of conflicts associated with what, uh, what is happening. Okay, so the next thing you have is Sweden and Nebraska. Okay, now I say Nebraska because it's one of several states that uh, has decided not to go forward with the shelter in place. I believe Kansas, uh, a couple of other states, uh, eight, eight states in total have not sheltered in place. And you would think that they would have a very high morbidity rate, right? The death rate there would be very high somehow, but that's not the case. And the question is why? Perhaps it's something to do with the fact that sheltering has maybe very little to do with the number of people that die. Perhaps it's because, for example, in Italy, that the reason why so many people had died is, is, is a result of many different factors, such as that they are much older in northern Italy. It's a, basically a retirement area in northern Italy. Uh, that they had a very poor social uh, medical system that was not able to adapt to this massive pandemic. And then third, that they had embraced so, much, uh, so many Chinese workers from Wuhan in particular and uh, proceeded to hug them and to have festivals with them and so forth, only amplifying the problem. So it, it was a disaster in Italy. And then you have Sweden, where, where they did not shelter in place, and they have just kind of kind of common sense approaches with uh, washing your hands and being careful and being careful to cover your, your mouth when you sneeze, like we did with SARS, like we did with swine flu. We just were smart about it, but we didn't shut down the entire economy. And, and so Sweden didn't do that. And now we see Sweden, uh, according to them, have a slightly higher number of deaths associated with this, but nowhere close to what you would expect. Nowhere close. And when you compare it to Denmark and Norway, yes, it's a little bit higher. A little bit. But when you compare it to Italy or Belgium or England or France, where they do have shelter-in-place orders, they're doing much better. So the question is whether shelter-in-place makes sense at all. It really moves us to the next question, which is, does it even work at all? People assume that it worked 100%, but it may only work maybe 10%. So 
So you may be reducing the numbers by instead of a uh, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 you thought, you might be reducing it down to uh, by another 20,000, which and every life is precious, of course. But do we change the entire world's economy and, and utterly destroy it for the sake of that small difference in lives? We have to think about these things. So if yes, to what extent? Now, the next thing, of course, is the consequential deaths. To what extent are we willing to live with the consequential deaths? Are we even asking those questions? I put it to you that in, in all the discussions that I've had on social media or among my friends or anyone who is debating with, with me on this, very little discussion is involved when it comes to the suicides, the poverty rates, and the extra hunger, and the ultimate decay of the infrastructure of uh, uh, civilizational issues. These even according to the UN's own standards, are going to dwarf the, uh, the deaths associated with the coronavirus itself. It's very bad news, but they don't want to discuss that because that's for another day, apparently. Right now, they want to deal with the coronavirus and only the coronavirus because they feel good about themselves. All right, uh, the next thing, of course, is chloroquine. And, and the other possible remedies associated with it. Uh, whenever there's even the hint that something might work, you see the left-wing media immediately seek to destroy any uh, hope of that being pushed forward. In fact, they even call that a, a false drug or you're giving them false hope or whatever might be the case. And the question is, why would they do that? Why? Now, it, it may very well be because they don't want Trump to be reelected. I get that. They tried with the Russian collusion thing. They tried with the Ukrainian collusion thing, the impeachment associated with that. They tried with the Brett Kavanaugh situation. They tried with uh, Stormy Daniels. Uh, time and time again, they tried to trip him up, but it didn't do so. This time, they really want to get him. They see this is an opportunity. But I put it to you that it's even further than that. Because if we were just getting rid of Trump, then you would not expect everyone else to be, uh, all the other countries to be doing the same thing in terms of trying to destroy uh, this president, right? It wouldn't just be for America, for Trump. I, I put it to you that the reason why is that many on the left see this as the ultimate opportunity to burn the mother down, as the expression goes. This is an opportunity to raise the entire ground Burn it down so that they can now start anew with a new civilizational order that they now envision will change everything. You heard as much from Gavin Newsom, who said that this is a great opportunity to make many sweeping changes. As they say, never let a crisis go to waste. Please support the Glasov Gang at jamieglasov.com and make sure you are subscribed to this Glasov Gang YouTube channel. Thank you.